So my name is Maureen O'Shea. I'm in the pharmaceutical industry. I spent 16 years in Procter & Gamble in fast-moving consumer goods, and then the last three in pharma. Um, Merck is a German-based company, 350 years old, 70% family-owned, and my part of the business is the biotech side. So cancer drugs, neurology drugs, fertility drugs, a very technically complex product to make, and a very high patient value to serve. So the service target really is 100% for us. Some of the, these are all life-changing or life-saving. So coming from fast-moving consumer goods, I had to reset my compass a little. And this presentation coming straight after Tom's actually is quite appropriate because I came from P&G, where all of that journey he showed has been pretty much close to its conclusion a few years ago. And then I moved to pharma, and everything that he showed, I was nodding to the stage where my head hurt throughout the presentation, because we're very much in that construction phase now. And one of the reasons I wanted to, to talk on the difference between the cost center and the competitive advantage is to give myself hope that when we finish this three-year journey, that we'll really be equipped to make the next leap forward, and probably the big difference for us. So what do I mean by supply chain as a cost center. Is this graphic familiar to anyone? The blood being extracted from the stone? Certainly what it feels like around most budget seasons. And I, I thought Tom phrased it very well earlier. It's not about, the great CEOs don't just squeeze cost. They look to add value. But in many cases, supply, the supply chain is seen as a cost center, as something to squeeze, rather than that value adder. And the big difference we're trying to drive now in Merck that we had before in P&G is really being that competitive advantage, getting that seat at the table and being able to bring that integrative role across the different functions. Because one thing we'll talk more as we grow through this, and as many of the solution providers today are talking about, is the visibility we have today in supply chain, the reach we have, is, is unprecedented and we have great value we can bring in those perspectives across the organization. So trying to get from the blood to the center. So, as we look along that journey, very much in Procter, the first part of that was really becoming customer-centric because certainly in older days, very often the supply chain function was full of experts, superb subject matter experts, who are masters in their own KPI, but not necessarily who is the customer and why, why does this matter. Once you've got that piece sorted, then you can look at your broader market. And of course, what we're all feeling every day is today every market is an evolving market. Your ABC classification of last year is more or less obsolete because the dynamics of the market are changing so quickly. And um, this morning, uh, getting ready, I was listening to the news, and they were talking about, I think in two or three years' time, was it one in seven sh supermarket visits will be to discounters, whereas years ago, I think it was one in 30. So customers like, uh, like Lidl have taken a place in, in middle-class England that they didn't have years ago, and they drive a very different product mix and selection back. So as society evolves, as market evolves, as purchasing trends evolve, our ability to understand, to forecast, to react, to produce needs to be very, very different. And then as we've gone through that evolving piece, how we handle it, how we segment, then we're ready to go to, to commercial and, and talk about that partnership, talk about that seat at the table and the value that we can bring. So, this I stole from an American colleague years ago the basic drumbeat from her organization. Every day, the same three questions. Who is my customer? Do I understand their needs? And am I delighting them? Because very often, we assume we know what the customer wants, or we take their literal request and focus like crazy on that literal request without knowing the business background behind. So I serve my products globally. And like all of us, our regions are different particularly my uh, Central European, um, Middle East, African group, are very different. 
So I innocently thought pharma demand was purely tied to patients. No, in those countries it's tied to the, the health of the balance sheet of the local health authority at that moment in time. So sometimes they will find they're coming into the quarter and a certain health authority can't pay their bills, so they're trying to push a cancer drug in another country, pull forward orders. So their request is, can I have the cancer drug early? But their need is, can you close my quarter OP? So when we know what the need is behind, we may be, may be able to say, well, no, that one can't come forward, but this one can. So we were able to ease a lot of friction with the commercial group in that region by stopping and asking the why behind. Because again, their intentions were great, but in a big global organization with a lot of languages and a lot of pressure, certainly in our organization, there are errors in translation along the way. So this drumbeat became very, very helpful to us, particularly as on the journey towards globalization for us as well. So in Merck, it's a German-owned company. The headquarters is in Germany. And it's, it's not quite unionized, but almost. So there are some legacy staff, some continuity staff, some staff for whom their tea break is sacred, regardless. So trying to shift the mindset of that organization back to, in our case, the patient and the customer has been quite a long journey. We've progressed significantly, but there's times we do put this up on the wall and keep coming back to that drumbeat. And, okay, we can sort of read it. Um, this is one we pull out quite a lot as well when we're having the discussions with them. So from left to right on the x-axis, you're talking about degree of performance from low up to high. And then the y-axis is customer service. So there's certain basics, service, cost, cash. Any gap in performance there will trigger significant frustration with the customer. And those obviously are your foundation. Until you're delivering solidly in all of those, you haven't earned the right for the other discussions. So when I was working before in Proctor, so Proctor are, are quite advanced. And they had, I don't remember the project, something really sexy and digital and cool. They said, Tesco, we shall go to Tesco with this wonderful project. And the delegation arrived and the head of Europe and their best suits went to sit with the head of Tesco to describe it. And he threw them out. He said, why, why are you talking to me about this? Your service is not acceptable. Until your case fill rate is a target, get out of my boardroom. And they were in the room five minutes and he kicked them out because the frustration there was so significant. He said, if you're talking to me about the sexy projects and your foundation isn't solid, you do not understand your customer. And that was the end of a very carefully planned presentation. It was a good learning moment. <laughs> we got a lot, quite a bit sharper after that. When you have one particular measure that's brilliant, you can get some customer satisfaction. But there are certain what we called the attractive requirements, yeah, we probably need a better name, where you really delight the customer. You really add a different value and you change your position within the, the hierarchy of that customer. Um, I was working in Spain a few years back. So any of you on holidays been to El Corte Inglés? Really should. Lovely department store. But it's a huge, huge department store and they have very advanced logistics. So Proctor obviously supplies many categories, one of which is batteries, Duracell batteries. So the same store would have batteries in the supermarket, in the toy department, and in the electronics. And they wanted to get to an everyday replenishment. So they, what they sold on Monday in the Seville store in the three departments, they wanted to replenish in three separate replenishments on the Wednesday. So we worked with them with a system to read their incoming EDI, split not by store, but by by department, run a picking system that would prepare the suborders and barcode them appropriately so they didn't need to open. They literally, they would take it off the truck, and I've been in the warehouse, literally just these big guys ripping open our pallets and chucking the boxes onto a conveyor. The scanner was red and would go up the conveyor, across, and down to the Seville truck. So we were the first supplier able to meet their wish that what was sold on Monday was replenished at that sub-level on Wednesday. So we therefore became their go-to supplier for promotions because they knew we could react fast enough. Because with another customer, if they wanted a promotion, they had to really invest in inventory to be ready to flow. 
whereas we had demonstrated that high flexibility, and therefore we were at the table for those discussions. And bizarrely, um, batteries were really important to them. It, toys, all those Christmas <laughs> campaigns were tied to having the right batteries. So who knew? So for each customer, what are the, the delighting elements, the elements where you can be unique? So then the evolving markets. And this one, this one it's sometimes, certainly to me and my team, has felt like a frustrator. Because you've just done the work on getting everything flowing so smoothly. And then the needs are changing really very, very rapidly in some cases. Um, Again, I was working in Spain coming up to a big general election and even more emotive than the one here. And it was at the time when there was, the crisis was starting to hit. The property bubble was just starting to dissipate. And the entire election campaign was about the country is doomed, only I can save you from every party. So customer confidence tanked. People stopped going to the supermarkets. When they went, they'd buy the own brand rather than the Ariel. Um, Gillette sales really dropped because the razor, you change it when it kind of needs to be changed, not when the bottle of shampoo is empty. So people were deferring their purchase. So we, in a matter of weeks, <coughs> saw a dramatic shift in people's purchasing patterns. So we had to go then right the way back up the supply chain down to, I was running the warehouse at the time, and our costs were pegged to a percentage of sales. And it suddenly became apparent our sales were about to drop by 20%. So how exactly could we remove 20% of our warehousing costs within three months? So there's a, a degree of agility there that, that we're not used to, I think. Well, certainly, we weren't used to. So the, the design, the desire, is that the supply chain is from the demand backwards. And particularly in pharma, today it isn't. It's very much from R&D technical. So right now um, in my current company, we launched seven weeks ago a new cancer drug, a new immune oncology drug. So it's, it's a wonderful drug. It's very exciting. The FDA have approved in two indications. It's a bastard to make. It's a really technically complex drug. So our supply chain is based purely upon operability and how they're going to produce this thing. But now going forward, this, so in cancer, you get your drug approvals per cancer type. So the US have approved it for skin cancer and now for bladder. And there's eight other indications that one by one they will approve. And there's a hundred other countries that will approve some or all of those eight indications. So we'll have up to 800 different independent demand curves, all of which by definition will be wrong, to integrate and build a flow. So we're now trying to figure out how on earth we go from an R&D driven supply chain to one with the flexibility to meet that. Because of course, it, it's, an, it's um, an injectable cancer drug when someone gets an infusion in the clinic. So it has to be very fresh. The quality has to be perfect and the quantities have to be perfect. Plus, it's horribly expensive, so no one wants to hold inventory. So trying to balance those um, conflicting priorities is proving to be a challenge. So uh, this one, I don't know whether or not you guys have seen. Um, it's quite an old definition of the different types of, of products. So your mules, not volatile, very low volume, the, the sellotape, the stuff that just sells fairly consistently. Uh, the jackrabbits are the bastards. You make no money, there's an infinite number of SKUs, and the volume flips randomly between said SKUs. The horses pay the bills. Over 50% of your sales volume comes through. Strong, predictable forecasting. Those are the ones your plant managers love. And then mad bulls, again, Difficult to forecast, highly volatile, but you're making money. So you need to figure out a way to get those things shipped. And for each of those, we're trying to go to quite a different forecasting model. Um, so obviously, plain statistics works well there. The jackrabbits were trying to go quite active forecasting at a SKU level. And mad bulls were using a mixed model with mixed success. 
So this actually is completely illegible. Oh, fabulous. This is stolen from our friends in JDA and is a very basic how far up along the supply chain we start to produce different things. So for these steady low volumes, we make to stock and then just pull off the orders because we know it'll come more or less. For these high value guys, we're making lots of money. We don't want to go full blown make to stock because of the, the inventory, but we can come back probably here to the assembly stage and configure to order. These are high value, so they're volatile, but we need to have a certain amount of stock, at least it's semi-finished, and be ready to flex quickly between the SKUs. And then these, we're trying to get as close as we can to make to order. And obviously, if you're make to order on something very volatile, you have some service risk. But we've had to, to try and make some choices. Okay, also completely legible. <laughs> what we're trying to say again was the, so this is the number of SKUs, the revenue, lead time requirements, inventory, and back orders. So your high value products here, I mean, they're 60% of the value. So you want to be doing better on both inventory and service on those and the other products. Um, the wee bastards can be 70% of your SKUs. And we've all at some stage tried an SKU rationalization progress. We've pulled the entire list of SKUs. We've found products that no one remembers still exist, but they're in the master data, they're live, and some creative sales guy somewhere will put in an order once a year. So the, there's the constant flow of trying to reduce those number down to a, a practical number of SKUs. So one thing I found in the current company, um, I think it's Euthrox, pyroids drug, widely used, 50 years old, in over 100 countries. We have evolved not just into many, many SKUs for language. We have 36 tablet shapes for the same medical product. So that's obviously a massive burden on manufacturing, not to talk from an inventory point of view. And it's just the work of an age to go with the customer, health authority by health authority, to say, would the circular 200 milligram be OK instead of the oval? So it's, now maybe the rest of you are much leaner and more efficient on that, but every company I've been in, every business, when I look at the SKU rationalization list, it's always eye-opening. So then again, those mad bulls, they're, they're small SKUs, but they're disproportionate pain everywhere else. And again, the exact percentages will depend on, on your business and your own analysis. But it's something that we've found useful because back when I started in supply chain, you do your ABC once a year, and that was kind of fine. But again, the rate of change we're seeing is, is driving different behaviors, at least from our side. So then that's just a summary of the one before. Now, this one actually depends quite a bit on pharma. Um, going, differentiating between our bulk, our filling, and our final packaging. So what we've found, for example, most of our products are produced very centrally and shipped globally. But for Latin America, we've had to go with um, a local packaging center. Because in pharma now, a huge thing is track and trace. And because there's so much um, counterfeit product out there, the customer needs a way of knowing that the unit in their hand that they're about to inject came from the right plant. So wonderful. So of course, every Latin American country has a different idea on how they'd like to do this. And in particular, Argentina changed the requirements, not monthly, but often enough that we hold no stock for Argentina. We just continually reproduce because they're continually different requirements. So we've gone for a pure local packaging operation there. Whereas other countries want, so a lot of the African countries want European product from a quality point of view. So therefore all of theirs must be centrally produced there and shipped down. So it's interesting. Okay. Any questions on any of this? I'm normally suspicious when everyone's quite this quiet. No? Okay. So then if we've gone through that piece where we feel our organization is customer centric and is genuinely using the customer needs in, as a prism through which decisions are made. If we feel with a strong understanding of our demand and of how much our demand is evolving 
and we've been able to, within the company, have the right conversations on what manufacturing flexibility we can offer with that demand, then we're equipped to go and, and sit with commercial. And again, I notice almost all of the, the providers here today are offering various digital solutions. And the key challenge always is how do we make those useful? Um, one of our VPs was talking before and he said, I want digital to make my business better, not cooler. Because some of our IT guys have very cool stuff and they're lovely dashboards and they're very sexy, really interesting. But how do we extract the, the business value? So from those opportunities, we can see things, and I think see things that commercial haven't seen before. So that gives us a different perspective, and we can really maybe have some new conversations. So this one, okay, I'm <laughs> terribly sorry you can't read any of this. Um, as we look across <coughs> sort of the realm of our work, obviously we're all doing operational planning, depending on the systems. We're all in or moving to the descriptive, predictive side of things. But what we're quite excited about is the advanced analytics and prescriptive. And for that, oh, I'd hope that would get bigger, but no. For that, we're using a company called Palantir. Um, they're based in the States. Basically, the CEO was in Davos and met him at the bar, and now we're working with Palantir. We're very strategic. Um, but they're, they're fascinating. They're the guys that I think the armies use in war zones to figure out where the landmines are planted because they're so good at extrapolating base data that they can figure out the patterns at which they'll be, they'll be in going forward. So we did a big pilot with them in Central America and we're now using them in China because I don't know about you guys, but our Chinese forecasting is appalling, um, particularly for the healthcare market because the model in China is it goes in to the main distributor to clear customs and then to the secondary distributor and then to the tertiary and through the hospitals. And there's a huge social value in hospitals there. So products that you or I today would buy over the counter, well, no, with a prescription here in Europe, there they go to have administered in the hospital. So the demand flow is very, very complex. What, what Palantir have been able to do for us, I think we can maybe see it better. No, no, we can't see it better on this slide. Um, they have been able to tell us when our competitor is going out of stock before the competitor knows. So they've figured out for, for drug products the, the rate of search that is normal. So your doctor gives you something, you take it home, and you often Google it just to frighten yourself on the side effects or to check is it to be kept in the fridge. But if the rate of Google searches, I think it goes a three sigma variation above, it means they're having trouble finding it. Uh, a pharmacy with the product in stock. So you can tell by the trending on Google of different products where there are service issues coming through. And obviously if it's a key product, a key competitor, you have a rough idea, well they source all of Central America from this factory, so if we're seeing issues in Argentina, let's get some safety stock into these seven countries immediately. So the, the level of accessible data is, re I mean, publicly available data is really, Impressive. So we've got some very interesting insights for them. And obviously commercial are very appreciative of that particular news because it really enables them to, to focus. Um, and it depends on the market. We have some products where we're one of 10. In our fertility drugs, we're one of three companies working in that area, which means if someone else goes out of stock, your market share can double. And that strains any supply chain. So last year in the US, um, one of the key pro fertility products, our competitor went out of stock and we went to 100% market share. And we had been remarkably fortunate. We were able to serve every unit of that increase. And that's been very, very helpful for us with commercial in the States because in our work, um, America, we all know how much healthcare costs in America. So the profitability in the drugs in America is really high and being out of stock there is a massive issue. So they are generally very conservative in their forecast because financially for the company, if they miss their OP by 5%, it, it's material for the company. So they always tended to undershoot us on forecast. But then in a case like this, where we were able to get prior visibility of a need and react, now they understand the value. 
and we have infinitely more productive IBP meetings in the States now than we had a year ago. So for us, that, that visibility has really helped, I would say, the maturity of the conversations and help them see, particularly for in pharma as well as commercial, medical are a huge part of the game. And for them to see the supply chain as a real partner was for us a step change. So that part really, really helped. So that's trying to show some nice stuff in the competitor analysis. And that's how the market itself is evolving. Because again, for discretionary products, the health of the market overall will tell you how your spending is going. Like the example before in Procter & Gamble during the election that Gillette sales went down. Gillette market share stayed at 90%, but the number of units sold went down because people shaved less often or were unemployed. So that data has been helpful. Has anyone else used Palantir? Or? I don't think they're in Europe much yet. No. There's a few of those companies coming out of Silicon Valley. There was one conference I was at before, and there was, um, I don't remember the guy's name, the CEO, this typical 32-year-old brain this size guy. And they were taking all the best guys from Google, from Apple, and coming straight out of MIT and running this amazing project in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia is administratively really complex, something like 100 different local authority subgroups with 100 plus um, data systems and multiple NGOs working there. So they had a massive amount of data completely unconnected. So these guys came in and did probably a classical data lake of the whole lot, but could then, and he, he did a live demonstration. They could say, okay, so let's get the relationship between number of malaria nets distributed and rates of malaria during the rainy season here. So they could say, okay, of these 100 areas, these nine have rainy season together and really dive down and show a level, a level of insight that drove a level of actions that they'd never had before on where the food aid should go on where the malaria nets were needed or not and where the proportional benefit of each action was the biggest. So they think there's, and again, a lot of the guys are, are ex-Google. So really brilliant, brilliant minds. And the ones we work with from Palantir, I mean, I'm not that old, but I could be most of their mother. So it's really these incredibly bright, bright, amazingly educated guys straight from MIT. I think they were born computing. And their ability to read the data, it's, it's really impressive. So yes, I think the biggest challenge for us, with, for us as a company dealing with these is how to get that balance between making the work better versus cooler. Because there's nothing they can't do. And now we generally, we have on our tablets very nice interactive functionalities, but it can be a rabbit hole. Because you can just dive down in the data forever, but not necessarily drive actions. So it's getting that balance there, I think, is, is critical. But basically, the, the one-line summary is we can see stuff that we've never seen before, and that commercial have no hope of seeing. So that is real value we can bring to commercial. And, oh, okay, I thought this was animated. If we look at our supply chain teams and who we have in the team and what we can offer the business, it's dramatically different than 20 years ago. We know more about our customer demand patterns, in some cases than our customer, and certainly more so than commercial. Um, so in the companies I've worked, commercial tends to be struct structured around key accounts. So they know their customer very well. But when we see the big shifts, people going from Carrefour to Lidl, commercial have a bit of a blind spot on the, the full industry switch. We have those predictive tools that we can see about the customer in a way that they can't. We have the analytical tools to take those insights and mine them for actions. Generally in the supply chain, we're very embedded with our manufacturing and procurement organizations. So we can quite rapidly turn those insights into some pretty real actions. Um, on a physical distribution level, we tend to know our customers very well also. When I was running the warehouse in Barcelona, the things we knew about our customers' warehouses, we knew the certain warehouse, your slot would be delayed by two hours, therefore, 
we knew where there'd be traffic jams in some. <coughs> and in some cases, we went back to them and said, hey, you always give us the morning slots. Can we come at 6 a.m. instead? And they go, oh, that would be amazing. They just had never thought to ask because the delivery terms had been set years ago that these trucks and these slots, or this company comes at this time, but the business had grown so much, we were then collapsing at one stage and very, very quiet at another. So using their, the practical insights with them worked really, really well. Now, when I was in the warehouse in Spain, we had one slight cultural challenge, that 10 o'clock means many things to many people but 10 o'clock to very few of them. And the warehouse, um, it had grown and we couldn't expand any further and with a real constraint and number of docks. So for each dock, we had four load preparation areas. And it was an, we, so we planned a four hour preparation. So the eight o'clock truck would clear the first slot. And then as soon as we'd loaded that, we'd use that slot to prepare the 12 o'clock truck. So in theory, all very clockwork, very neat. But once the 8 o'clock driver is half an hour late, you know already you'll be half an hour late for your 12 o'clock driver. So we had this really negative spiral where the drivers wouldn't come on time because they knew the load wouldn't be ready, and then the load couldn't be ready because the driver hadn't come on time. So we ended up with one of our more progressive hauliers. They had maybe a third of the business. So we literally just spent the morning on the floor with the guy and showed it to him. And he said, okay, but if my guys are on time and then someone else isn't, they're still late. Said, okay. So we locked two docks just for him. So we said, your truck will be the eight and the nine and the 10 and the 11 and the 12. So if your first driver is late we can, uh, on time, we can guarantee the rest. And we went from an average turnaround time of six hours to getting our two hour turnaround with that haulier in a matter of weeks, just by that small, action on the inside of the data that came with them. And then obviously once the other hauliers saw their guys going in and out quickly, they all came knocking at the door to go, why does he get such good service? And we had the entire warehouse at a 90% two hour turnaround very, very quickly. And in that case, it was the right thing at the right time because it was just when the driver's discs had come in. Well, just when the Spanish police had started to check the driver's discs, meaning they had to stop after 11 hours. So if you, were, if you were late loading, they were stuck. So they were engaged, and we had a solution, and together the data helped. And one thing that I think is relevant is the talent pool. I think we have a better quality of leader in supply chain than we've had before. I think we look for a broader type of skill than we're bringing people in, and I think we stretch and grow our people a lot more than before. So both they have more to bring, and they're keen, keen to bring it, keen to come with the projects, keen to interface with commercial. So the value proposition is really, to my mind, very different than it was five years ago or, or even 10. So I actually really like this uh, graphic, because I think it sort of captures, we have a unique perspective. We can see things about the business and about the industry that no one else in our company can. And if we understand the customer and commercial well enough, we can come to them with unique insights that they can drive commercial value from. So as Tom says, it's all about creating value. And we can, I think, highlight and underline opportunities that, that haven't been seen before. Yes. Now, I was going to give some case studies, but we're going to run quite tight on time. Any questions before I start rambling again? It's nearly the last slide. Don't worry. We'll finish on time. Um, a silly one. In the UK, there's a lot of promotions, and nappies are a brilliant thing for a supermarket promotion. Because anyone with small children, nappies are hideously expensive, so they'll go and do the family shop in the place with nappies on promotion. And because Proctor was so multi category, we had just our Pampers guys doing the promotion, and then we quite quickly realized that the family that were going in to shop for the Pampers on promotion would buy everything else as well. So we had to do a, a trickle-down effect of that promotion across all of the different categories, both within those Tesco stores and reducing the flow to other stores near the Tesco. 
So the whole local ecosystem would be affected by that Tesco ad going in the paper. So how we took that and built our way backwards. And we ended up with supply chain people of Proctor with desks inside Tesco because we had, after the whole being thrown out incident, because we, <laughs> we learned, we learned. So after we then really understood the importance of service to them, really built the relationship and had the example of the promotion, they let it, we had them two days a week, they would sit in the Tesco office with the commercial team, the Tesco commercial team. So they absolutely had the sense of smell of their business needs and then could come up with, with the winning solutions. Next day replenishments was basically that case we talked earlier in Spain of really what they sold on day one would come through an EDI that night, be produced and picked, and then in their stores again on the Wednesday. The physical distribution pain points I think we mentioned. Ah, so I talked about the new cancer drug that we launched. The, it was what's called an orphan indication, meaning if you had that type of skin cancer, there was no approved treatment in the US. And it's a really nasty skin cancer, it's a fatal one. So we had a, an internal decision that the, if the FDA approved one day, we wanted product available to sell to the patient the day after. And the issue is, in order to sell, so it's, it's a little vial, so it's a vial with liquid inside, a, a label, a leaflet, and a carton. But what's printed on the label is a function of the FDA approval. So we literally, we had naked vials, so just product inside a plain glass vial with nothing on it, sitting in the States, approved customs waiting to go. And we had printing presses booked, sitting, hovering. We had the regulatory approvers sitting, hovering over keyboards. So with it, we had to go from the FDA approval to updating the leaflet, to approving it, to printing, to helicoptering the leaflet to the production site where we hand packed the initial quantity and it's a collaboration with Pfizer, and Pfizer have a private jet. So we use the private jet to ship this much product across. But it meant that we got approval on Friday, and the product was available for the patients on Monday. And that involved some gymnastics from the supply chain, but from a company point of view was, was tremendously engaging. And from the medical community were then very, very engaged as well because we've had some cases before during the clinical trials where we had people, I mean, literally weeks to live, and they went on this treatment and were cured, not just got a few more months, cured. So we had tremendous emotional engagement behind making this one happen. And with that focus, it became possible. And it was a good thing we had stock on ground because we sold the entire year's forecast in six weeks. So one of those typical moments where commercial are ecstatic and supply chain are just on the ground going, oh God. Because, and in each, we had three or four big steps in the volume. And in each case, supply chain saw it before commercial or medical. So in each case, when they turned around to say, that's a lot of new patients this week, we'd go, it's on the truck. And again, we had some gymnastics in the background to make it possible. But because we were so attuned to the flow, we were watching sort of at a unit level, and we had visibility out to the key, um, not warehouses, the key distributors holding the product and their stock level. And we'd done all that analysis in advance, so we could smell straight away that the rate of flow through there is far too high. So trigger back, print more leaflets, get ready to flow because we make this in Switzerland. So we had to get it made in Switzerland through customs, the US, FDA cleared, and the warehouse. So we got them a year's volume to cover those first six weeks. So again, we now have the right to discuss, and we've had very interesting discussions with the commercial team and with the medical team, because that same drug will launch in Europe in a few months. And Europe, if anything, is more difficult to forecast for us than the US. So we've just shown the volatility, and because we were able to react and we're able to diagnose that volatility, we're now doing a completely different piece of work on the demand forecasting for the rest of the countries. So for the business and for the patient, that forward looking was, was a success. So the very basic, 
trying to go from extracting blood to a stone, really leveraging our unique perspective. And I do think today in supply chain, we have a unique perspective. We're very privileged in that position in the business to really get that seat at the table and bring competitive advantage.